what I hear is a question about ethics, yes? That if the hornets live an ethical system, I won't say they have an ethical system, but live an ethical system which has this pattern. It goes, uh, 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 right? Uh, could one then say of the mm, total mammalian or vertebrate population of the animal park that its internal violence, who eats who when, is built into its, whatever the curve of its existence may be, whatever variable you want to plot on, on a time span, which is going to oscillate, because that's how things work, after all. And that the real statement, therefore, about animal ethics, and let's not extend to the human being for the moment, the real statement about animal ethics is always to be comprised within time spans. That there are not acts which are labelable as lethal, lethal to species, immoral, bad, something of that kind. No judgmental point. Uh, because your ethics have always got to be thought of in terms of that curve. Now, we think, you know, that there are bad acts. And the, the, the audience can be shocked a bit about those worker hornets stealing candy from the babies. as if this were context-independent. And that seems to be what we've done, is to breach the, uh, the jigsaw pattern, pattern pieces, the separate fitting together pieces of the civilization and say, <coughs> Our rules are going to run right through, regardless of context. Now, we do this, so to speak, before the law. Uh, within, say, religion, of course, we are very context-sensitive. Uh, don't make a noise in the yard while people are meditating upstairs. Um, hundreds of things of this kind. Take off your shoes when you go into the zendo, uh, and so on. But sort of in our open society, we've, we've, we've dropped... The law, you see, can't really handle context properly. <laughs> it likes to, uh, you know, catch people on some particular identifiable act and, and, and avoid inquiry into intent, if it can, and avoid inquiry into context other than the identifiable act. And if you can reduce things to that, then, then it's got a fairly simple job on its hands. But this, of course, does not represent a biological system and how a biological system works, even a human biological system of human beings, because they live in context. contextual, say, social ethics of the dolphins in regard to their own interpersonal relationships. 
and also in their reaction to two predators, the shark and the human being, who both apparently would like to exterminate them or come close to them on occasion. And then their reaction is not a non-violent reaction to both the shark and the human um, The data is very poor, step one. Uh, step two, I was going to say they're very self-contained. I think that would be the word. Uh, I think they're very stupid, you know, in many ways. Uh, I think fairly obviously the whales, the ones that are being hunted specifically, and nowadays the porpoises are being hunted too, um, could very easily have prevented the development of whaling industry. You know, they only have to use a certain amount of sense in their avoidance reactions and be more or less unpredictable in how they retreat and things of this kind. But no, they, they didn't do that. And they've let a whaling industry develop and still don't take reasonable precautions against whaling ships. Well, you, you can't have a why for why they don't do things. You only have a why for, for unexpected things they do do. <laughs> um, the ethics vis-a-vis -vis human beings Uh, if you get in the water with them, this, this the, my feeling was that they take over a parental role vis-a-vis -vis you. I mean, you, 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 you go play with a dog or a cat, you are on the whole in a parental or pack-leading role, something of the kind, vis-a-vis -vis the dog or the cat. If you get in the water with a porpoise, you are a child vis-a-vis -vis the porpoise. You're a filial relationship to the porpoise. Um, and there's a tendency, if he likes you, for him to sort of bend around you, as, as, as a porpoise does around a baby porpoise. Uh, he will correct you, or she, The porpoise assumes a right to the timing, to the initiative of what's going to happen. I got in the water and determined I wouldn't tell the porpoise what to happen next. I would fold my arms and sit there. And the tank had steps going down into it. And old sissy came around. Am I trying not to give clues, but you can't, obviously not. You know, you are a message in yourself. You propose whatever. All right, she comes around and she draws up alongside me here, about an inch from me, and we bump each other a little bit, the, you know, a certain amount of movement in the water. Those bumps are not messages. She doesn't think they're messages, and I don't think they're messages. I take my cue from her on that. And that lasts, oh, several minutes. And then she moves out and takes a look at me and comes around a little bit on this side. And then she comes up behind here and her beak comes through under my elbow uh -huh, slowly. And the next thing I know, I've got an eight foot porpoise across my knees. Uh, and at this point, I wasn't able to not give signals. <laughs> <laughs> and we were engaged in play of some kind, right? And that was all right and everything fine. Uh, next day, repeat, repeat performance. I go in and again, 
trying not to give signals. She comes up alongside. I put my hand on her, thinking, now why go through all this rubbish, you know? Uh, she swims away, comes around, gives me a flick with her tail as she goes, and goes down to the other end of the tank. Uh, no, you don't do that, you see. She is in control of timing and initiative. And no doubt if I had not made a move, she would have started to play, accept me as some sort of a baby porpoise in another two or three minutes. Um, I don't know, is this the sort of question you're ask, asking? Uh, I think so, but I, I've got another question. Um, <laughs> you said the whales, you know, were stupid. Uh, John Lilly says the size of the brain of the dolphin is bigger than ours, and it's more intelligent. And, and he's going to spend the rest of his life trying to understand, you know, why they behave as though they were stupid, but he, he says their brain was suggested that, that, that they're not stupid, that they're both more intelligent and have a higher social ethic. Wait, wait, I agree their brain no doubt is bigger. I mean, he's measured their brain, so this is something you can, you can answer. How big is this lump of stuff, right? Um, what they use it for, um, whether they use it, um, all those, these questions I don't know the answer to. I would find it very hard to give a give evidence which would say that a dog as a porpoise is more intelligent or is as intelligent as Latin. Right? Now, Lassie, you know, is not very much more intelligent. She's a little more, I suppose, quick to pick up what the trainer wants. She's where her skill lies. Now, remember the whole thing is put together after the event, you know. You see Lassie uh, go and get her master's pipe out of a suitcase open the suitcase, get the pipe out, bring it to her little boy master. He's not allowed to smoke, I guess, but um, that sort of a thing. You see an, an, a circus animal go through a sequence of action. You've got to remember that was taught backwards. Uh, that first of all, you teach the animal to accept food from your hand or accept a pat from your hand or something. Accept a reward. Then you teach the animal uh, to give you a pipe or whatever this thing is to perform the immediately preceding action to get the reward. And then you train him to do the thing preceding that to do the thing that preceded in the end, and you add, you build up the sequence backwards. It looks as though the animal was very intelligent and knew all about pipes in suitcases to bring to masters to get, uh -huh. this is not so. It goes backwards. Um, we had a trainer in Hawaii whose task assigned to her was to train a porpoise to slalom, as it was called, through rings. There were three big hoops side by side, and the porpoise was to go through hoop A and back through hoop B and then through hoop C. And the trainer spent about three months of frustration trying to do this. Um, she would train the animal to go through A, and that would go nicely, you know, everything going fine. Then she would try to add hoop B. And the animal would complain that it didn't get a reward for going through A. Uh -huh. And would refuse to go through B. And then the trainer and the animal would get into a mutual jam and no, uh, fast. And finally, 
the trainer brought the problem up to Karen Pryor and me, and we looked at it. And the answer was, start with hoop C, for God's sake. Get your animal to go through C, then get it to go through B in order to go through C and get the reward. Then train it to go through A, to go through B, to go through C, adding the hoops on at the beginning, not between what is learned and the reward. You can't break that link. Now, is this very sensible? How do you evaluate this? Uh, I'm inclined to think that our entire education system dealing with human young would do well to consider this very carefully. Uh, but if you are going to try to teach people to, le to recite, I know, I know rote learning isn't fashionable anymore for very bad reasons, um, but to recite, um, what should we say, to be or not to be, that is the question. And who would fardel spare to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it might be a very good idea to teach them to recite the end of the speech first, and then to recite the middle in order to get to the end, to get the approval, and then to recite the beginning, building it up backwards. Corpuses. I had spent a few hours watching at uh, SeaWorld in San Diego, yeah. the trainers working with the dolphins there. And uh, is what I noticed the war going on? I mean, what I seem to what I seem to see was that the, the dolphins there's absolutely a war going on between the trainers. The do dolphins seem to be really playing a game with the, with the trainers they weren't about to just do. The dolphins playing a game with the trainer happens. Um, and trainers like to have some of this. And it's still a matter of how much you can train per training hour and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and trainers vary very much. Uh, we had a professional dog trainer in Hawaii, a man who had been a professional dog trainer and was now a porpoise trainer. He was now chief of porpoise trainers. And we had a dog and we had trouble with our dog going out on the road. We were afraid she'd get killed. Traffic. So I asked who's it's about this. What do I do? And he said, well, uh, you won't tell me what I told you. And I said, well, I'll be attending a meeting in Lindisfarne in a few years, and I propose to tell them all about it. Um, and I agreed I wouldn't tell, at least not around Sea Life Park. He said, all right, well, you get a leash and you put the dog on the leash. You get a belt and you say to the dog, you hold him with the leash and you say no. And you follow the word no with the belt as hard as you bloody well can. And then you say no again. And if he does not instantly um, go into a quiver at the word no, you belt him again. Until the word no is a complete negation as coming from you. Right. You then love him up and you take him for a walk around your grounds. And every moment he puts his nose anywhere near the boundary of where you don't want him to go beyond, you say no. You will never need to beat him again. From there on, you can control him with love. Now, 
You see, you don't see this side of animal training. This is not, even the VIPs when they visit are not shown these things. But there's always a tendency that way in animal training to establish an enormously strong relationship. And after that, to use all humanity. It seems like education. You put the kids in an institution and control them, and then you're very nice to them as good teachers. That's right. I want to ask you a question, Gregory, about not so much what you think, but how you think. <coughs> and, uh, live one. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. You, you know, you've studied the Yatmo and corpuses and schizophrenic families and ethology generally. And it seems as a listener that you, um, you tell parables and you line them up and you're thinking in uh, perhaps what I'm clumsily trying to figure out is hieroglyphic thinking. And to do that, I want to imitate you somewhat and line up two analogies. Good. Uh, First analogy came up the other night when we were just uh, talking about Moray patterns with um, Catherine. And I was saying the mystical process of enlightenment, to use a paradox, is a flashlight in search of darkness. And somehow or other, the flashlight learns that a flashlight in search of darkness is expelling what it's looking for and turns it off and then realizes that the darkness now is not only out there, but in it. And there's a unity of knower and known. Uh, Second analogy, if you look at the world with a video camera, you make images of it, which you can see on a video screen. Maybe that's eye and brain. Uh, if you turn the video camera onto the video screen, you get a feedback pattern on the screen, which is interesting. If you have a place to stand outside to observe that it's interesting. You know, um, again, that goes back to the quotes in T.S. Eliot, two of when two of us are going down the road together, who is that third that always follows us gilded in a brown, mm -hmm. you know, hooded in a brown robe? Uh, who is that other? The mystical process of enlightenment then is from the aphorisms of Patanjali, let the seer slay reality and then slay the slayer. What is that other thing then is, that is slaying the slayer? Now, those are the familiar ways in the mystical disciplines by which you realize that the brain is a reducing valve, that the central nervous system is constructed so that you're not living in reality, you're living and inhabiting your own descriptions of reality, and that the process of discovering the universe is a process of uncovering or letting go or unlearning or um, getting rid of the central nervous system. Now, if one is working at it not so much through mystical disciplines... I never got rid of my central nervous system. No, of course not. <laughs> if one isn't observing, if one isn't going through these mystical disciplines, but is functioning as an epistemologist or a Western philosopher, and you turn the video camera back onto the video screen to get the feedback pattern, what do you see when you observe the way you think? And when you observe yourself making analogy after analogy after analogy, and you jump up to a metal level to see the isomorphic structures mm -hmm. of all those analogies. Offhand, I would say, I see the trees and the green grass. But that's not a very satisfactory answer. I ought to see one, though. I don't know, there, I, I mean, there's a sort of thinking which is essentially seeing the green grass, right? Mm. 
But then there's another, which one might do in bed or in the dark, or lining up material for a, a lecture or something. But then this sort of lying in wait. When he's sort of seeing the green grass, uh, I'm thinking of an episode. We were in camp, what, two weeks ago? With Nora and Vanny in the Redwoods. And Vanny said, Granddad, what's the color of the redwood inside where you can't see it? Now that's a hell of a question. <laughs> that's much better than um, Bishop Barclay's problem about the tree that falls and doesn't make a sound. Is the wood, has the wood got a color inside the tree? Um, no, no, flash, right? Um, the girl with the Japanese, we practice respect, flash. Um, the wasp nest I got from a, an ethological conference in Amsterdam, where they ran the film, flash. I can't remember much else that was in that conference. Hell, what, what were they talking about? There were a lot of other things. Yeah, there was a nice thing about colonial spiders. Um, walking around with a jigsaw puzzle with a hole in it. Looking for a piece that'll fit. But this doesn't answer your question, does it? It's lining up more analogies. That it's rather than answering my question, it's performing the same pattern. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. And that you pattern. want to pick me up at the next level after that. Yeah. Hmm? Well, that that can be, but uh, that is an answer. Well, who so said? Is, somebody offered me an answer. No, he said that was the answer. Oh no, no, no. No, I decline, on the whole, at conscious levels, the answer that um, David has all the time, David Spangler. Uh, David says the ball is red, and two minutes later he's saying red is the ball. Uh, then then you get other attributes and so on. And in the end, you have to come around to the ball is the ball is the ball. I am that I am, or whatever. Because you split into attributes and use the attributes as subjects instead of predicates. And now you have to get back again. Now that's a different process from what I use. I mean, this would be a partial answer to your question again, wouldn't it? But another one, not mine. Um, language is a sort of um, top filter, top testing, um, what do they call it in factories, where the, the finished product has to go through a final testing before it's Quality control, yeah, quality control, that's it. That's provided by language. Now, the actual steps by which analogies are caught and made is not linguistic. That's, that's diagrammatic in some way, mm -hmm. quasi-visual. Mm -hmm. Quasi-kinesthetic. Um, we had Krishnamurti, and I talked about his 
Aristotle shared component, his tips of the toes quality. That's, that's really Well, then one is always, you know, playing binocular vision. I think that's one of the things. I mean, if you, with one eye you can see the world, you know, it's all right. With two eyes you see it in depth. All right. If you have some porpoise material and you have uh, something about lands that you got from Conrad Lorenz and something about, you know, you can start making binocular perceptions, binocular, combined triangulations. And two parables is better than one. Four parables is better than two, I guess. You what? I'm wondering what you're saying about trying to watch how we perceive or think, or think in this case. It's not some way tied into the last thing you're talking about concerning will. Because it struck me that will is not necessarily an aspect of character at all. Neither is it of the first level. You're actually creating a third <coughs> aspect. And you, I've told you going that direction. Do you have some... Yeah, I would agree with that. Excuse me? That I would agree <laughs> that you see something, I mean, a face with, with, with a pair of spectacles on it. Uh, you see something, um, the fact that a porpoise's eyes are on the sides of its head and not in the front. All right? These two together begin to make you know, a little nucleus of ideas. Uh, let's stick some more on that Hindus think they have another eye in the top of their heads. I wonder what. Um, that um, the dinosaur can't use his tail as a sense organ because it's too far away, neurologically speaking. Um, I mean, I'm exemplifying the process with more or less nonsense examples, yes? Right. But as you, you start putting them together, and you get two eyes in order to get from a flat to a depth, and this in a sense is the addition of a logical typing, in some sense, or an analog of an addition of a logical typing. And I think the answer to Bill's question is, how does one climb logical typing ladders? How does one climb from the knowledge to the knowledge about the knowledge to the knowledge about the knowledge? And why do you use multiple analogies to do that? Well, you do you, for just that reason, really. But the leap is contained. The you see, uh, the, the, uh, the thing you've got to not be caught in uh, is thinking that the piece of a pattern is a pattern. Thinking that the energy explains the pattern. Now, um, you see, the, the, the primary case right down at the bottom of the fundamental of the whole structure, is that all that you can see is, all that can enter your sensorium is news of a difference. You cannot have your sensorium entered by information about a state. A state. You are in principle like the frog in the saucepan. You know, he sat down in cold water in the saucepan. And somebody put the saucepan on the fire and very slowly warmed it. If they warmed it fast, he would be sensible, sensitive to the gradient and hop. If they warm it very slowly, 
There is no gradient to which he can respond which will tell him this is the moment to hop. He won't hop. He's like a chain without a weakest link. He doesn't know where to break. But this is, I mean, the spatial one is the chain without a weakest link, and the slowly changing gradient is the, the one over time. It doesn't define a moment, and therefore is not a stimulus. Yeah, it gets boiled. Hmm? An item of behavior. Um, hmm? An item of behavior. Is there a Various signs. <coughs> observations about plants being consolidated into prunes in a scale that's inefficient and for the health of the whole system and inappropriate use of resources that goes along with it. Um, now my response to that, and I think a lot of my response at this conference um, is rooted in quantitative thinking. I say that's immoral. It's like the way I am about the hornet. And I want a strategy <laughs> to affect items of behavior at that proto learning scale. So I think about laws. I mean, I say, I ask Barry, what does that mean? Do we go into SEC mm -hmm. and do something about legislating Quiet. that change? Okay. Um, I'm essentially saying that's nonsense. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not until practically because I know that you know, that is, there's an impact there. There's a paradox of power. Yeah. And so you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, I try and think about that item of behavior in the terms that you're laying out. And I was, I was really feeling the difference between law and discipline. You talked about discipline as a way of affecting do-real mm -hmm. the patterns, the patterns of thinking that give us consolidation of plants into firms at an appropriate scale. Um, yeah, those patterns are wrong. Exactly. In, in the sense, those pragmatic the patterns, sense, wrong. Those are the patterns that we want to change. Yeah. So I think, okay, practice and discipline, and I think of spiritual discipline, um, in my own experience, mm -hmm. as being a place to look. So I've got, in a way, two patterns that are meshing. I'm getting that moray pattern. I have, on one level, I have a, a pattern of spiritual discipline, and that tradition comes in. And at another level, I have something about social change and a pattern that says to me, um, I, will, I need to alter this. There's something wrong. Mm -hmm. I have information, a pattern of information that's coming in that's saying, wrong, 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 wrong. Um, what I'm groping for, and I guess what I've been groping for this whole conference is, what is that new pattern that's going to be audible to my ears? Um, how can I begin in a more precise way to deal with that item of behavior? Those consolidated terms, or maybe those sewage disposal plants, mm -hmm. those regulations, and that way of thinking that ends up with flush toilets and no water. I think I'm inviting you, maybe, to do that analysis to sewage disposal plants or those terms. Maybe that's one of the, maybe that's what, what we can, maybe that's the beginning of a new conversation. Well, we don't know. I mean, obviously, every now and then, organisms make a, a jump of this kind. And you're talking about a jump. You're, you're stuck at a certain premise level, and you've got to make the jump to discover those aren't the only premises in the world. There are other possibilities. And you try all the alternatives at the lower level, and they won't work. But in general, you go on trying, if this one didn't work, 
Well, you'll try that one. Uh, that one. Well, now I've forgotten about that one, and I'll try that one again. And you go round and round the available alternatives at the lower level. Uh, you're asking for a recipe in terms of the lower level, which will carry you up to the upper level. Now, and that there's no answer to, you see. Because there isn't an answer at the lower level about how to get up to the upper level. Um, the only answers are, um, you know, meditate, uh, go for a swim, um, have a battle, um, uh, try a dose of LSD, um, whatever. And these are, these are none of them um, are concerned with the immediate context. They, they shake the whole cage to see where you can get to, or relax the whole cage or something. That's fine. And that's all, we, all as far as I know that you can be offered. That's an isomorph of my question. Hmm? That's an isomorph of my question. Yeah, so yeah. How do you get to the metal level? You fly, man. <laughs> Charles? The old joke, um, uh, there's an old Swede joke, yump, and you'll make it in two yumps. <laughs> Charles? <laughs> the film we saw last night is called Shadow Catcher. That's, I didn't like the explanation they gave of why they called uh, the guy Shadow Catcher. It wasn't just because he stood before the sun and blocked the sun. No. Because those pictures were two dimensional. Very much. The so. shadow of the three dimensional objects they were photographing, the people. In the same light, these three dimensional objects about us are the shadow of another dimension, the fourth dimension, or whatever. This is, this is a tenet that runs through a lot of esoteric teachings. Mm -hmm. This is the shadow world. Yeah, yeah. And the objects are someplace else. What you're asking him to do is describe those objects in the language of this dimension, which is impossible. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's always been impossible, and yet, you know, some people do it very prettily. <laughs> well, no, there were... There were several reasons. Well, no. I would know the way an artist or a, um, a mystic would deal with it, but what I was trying to get at is an epistemologist. Gregory yeah. will go over yatmal and porpoises and schizophrenic. And he'll have these flashes, and he'll see things, and then he'll lecture, and he'll line up a series of parables. Well, now, what happens if Gregory observes the stream of his own consciousness of the history of all of Gregory's analogies, and sees isomorphs and homologs, and then, flash, sees something about the nature of thought? He was moving in that direction when he said it's not verbal, because I think there are certain levels of seed forms, hieroglyphs, geometric forms that then come down and generate into other levels of consciousness and then have many different contents. And in this case, you can even use, you can take energies from physics and use them metaphorically rather than quantitatively. For example, I can say uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother in a tantric relationship gener generates a community of Auroville. And I can say that's analogous to two electrons in a Cooper twin relationship going through a, su a superconductor that holds the whole thing together and creates a single quantum state. Now that whole thing is using physics as a, as a hieroglyph, as a, as a metaphor, which has nothing to do with the quantitative aspects of superconductive theory. And it annoys physicists when I do this, you know, yeah. I've gotten into this with, with uh, Lewis here. Um, <laughs> um, and so it, it seems to me it's an interesting question. What I'm asking is, what is the nature of epistemological enlightenment? <laughs> Because I think God can be realized in the body, Nijinsky. God can be realized in the heart, the Hopi, the Indians. God can be realized in the soul, which is basically the Asian path. But I also think God can be in, in, uh, experienced and embodied in the mind, which is something, because we're a mental culture, we no longer believe. And when faced with an epistemologist or a sage, I'm pushing him in a direction to that to see, in a sense, if he'll just take a meta-level meta jump in front of me and spin another analogy out. <laughs> but I think it's going to take some more coffee cups and, and conversation, or maybe it'll take another twenty years. And like the uh, the Japanese analogy. Yeah, they take time. Uh, what goes on during the time? I don't think there are differences. That's my, that, but that's a belief I have. 
Yeah. Yeah. But we all uh, jump and dance together. There's something about though. time in this story. When we jump together, it's a dance. That's my answer to that. When we what? No, she said it's for me to jump and not for you. And I said when we all jump together, it's a dance. Oh, ah, yeah. Virginia? When you're talking about uh, where we start with that observable world and that sensorium, the basic information, simply the difference that makes the difference, that's exactly what I want to get at. You can see a difference that others may not see. How do we, what distinguishes this? And I wonder, is it the focal awareness or peripheral? In other words, you look at borders and edges, appearance. Uh, and that sort of, whereas if you concentrate on con on the content, you know, focus in, you may get certain things like a tab was describing, looking at more and more species. In other words, it's a concentrated thing. And maybe it gives you depth, depth of learning about what you're concentrating on. But peripheral awareness, where you, you, you phase in and then you become aware of other patterns. <coughs> it's almost like Castaneda's way of difference between uh, looking and seeing. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, it seemed to me you were picking up on, I'm not sure whether this um, looking at edges gets you to another level, and then once you start that, uh, that brings in other things. Does this tie in with what you're, in other words, borders, edges, uh, comes as, constitutes the difference for you as one of the elements. Uh, I think I give a somewhat false picture of my own operations uh, because I don't know how to talk really or don't talk enough about the lowest levels. Uh, for me, all this goes back to Oh, uh, identifying beetles with a key, with a, a you know, key of alternatives, uh, which is where I spent a great part of my childhood. Uh, now, of course, it's all nonsense. Um, we all knew even then that such keys are, in fact, not the structure of the space through which the evolution of the beetles occurred. You get the idea? I mean, yes, the evolution was a, it was a tree of some kind, right? And, and the, the key for identifying them is a, is a tree of alternatives. If it's like this, it's like this. If it's like this, it's species A. If it's like this, well, then go on to page 10, where you get you know, such and such and other family and so on. Now, uh, what I don't really properly communicate is the amount of that sort of detail of one kind or another that I've sweated on, fooled around with, swallowed, and forgotten, you know, to a great extent. But it's been through there. Now, you want to get another analogy? That's all you get, you know. But you know, last year you said the importance of rote learning was so that there was a sufficient amount so that these unconscious processes of, of insight can take place, and when you try to make knowledge stimulating yeah, yeah. How and groovy feed, right away. Feed, feed the furnace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to be groovy and have insight immediately without context, then you're frustrating the process of discovery. That's true. That's true. I can say some things about how not to do it. Yeah. yeah. I like the idea of context for about learning that's probably quite critical. Which one? Context. And uh, why... In the West, we seem to be blind to it. For instance, Joseph Needham has done a, a comparison of Chinese law and Occidental law, in which he found that Chinese law was, they had no concept of law, really. It was very particularistic, detailed, contextual. 
a Burma law was very abstract, general, and ended up in the Middle Ages with weird events such as pigs being tried for the murder of humans and animals being tried in court of law for abstract uh, <coughs> legal situations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what um, what sort of premises do you see behind this lack of contextual thinking? And what kind of view of the world do we have that we don't see? Lack of contextual, you mean sort of meta contextual? Right. Well, it was not an accident that I built this up and went first to the aesthetic before I went to the uh, behavioral patterns. Uh, the primrose on the river's brim. Now, that's one of my Springboards. You ask what it's like. Well, it's again like a, a, a visual perception. Now, I talked, I'm sure, last year about Ames experiments or something like that. And uh, um, the fact that perception is an action which most of us forget most of the time. Now, that you think you see me, you don't. You see your image you made of me. And when you discover that, this is a big setting free. When you discover that all you have is map, I mean, it's really nonsense to say the map is not the territory. The territory is a map, too. <laughs> you know, it's a map of a map. And a map of a map of a map. Well, let's... Oh, I just want to bring up one other point you were talking about with metal levels and so on. Uh, and you were just talking about the word time. So it out. The, the word time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking of uh, when we when we have our experience of three dimensions, and there's been a whole lot of stuff written, nonsense and otherwise, about the fourth dimension, mm -hmm. the fifth dimension, and so forth. <coughs> and there have been some uh, rather simple books written, I guess, for the moment, many of us may be familiar with Abbott's Flatland, yeah. in which you have, in which you imagine that you're a two-dimensional being. And you're trying to get some concept, which would be a meta concept of what the three dimensional uh, mm -hmm. universe would be like. Yeah. And the interesting thing to me was that the, the an example cited, I think it was, I don't know whether it was cited by Abbott or by Dispensky, or by one of them who was interested in this kind of problem, imagining uh, that you're in your flat land and that a pencil is caused to be made to penetrate this two-dimensional space in which you happen to exist, and that's the only kind of space you know. Yeah, yeah. And your description of the movement of the pencil will be that at a certain point there wasn't anything in that flat man, and at the next instant something was born, maybe a little bit of lead or something like yeah. that, and then that would begin to go through a light, and would, would end up with the wood and paint and the, a lot of things. I mean, you could describe all of the structures, and finally, when the, when the pencil was pushed all the way through that particular universe, it would die and it would disappear. So that, but the pencil was still the pencil in three-dimensional space, but to the individual in two-dimensional space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happens is that you experience time, and as Pensky put out as a uh, as an axiom, I think uh, this was one of his early works years ago when he was interested in four-dimensional geometry and, and uh, so on. That when we're in a given number of dimensions, that uh, the next higher dimension is experienced by us as time. Experience? Experienced by us as time. He maintained that animals, oh, I see. He yeah, maintained yeah. That animals for example, or when you get the view of the worm or something, that that's kind of a one-dimensional view of the universe. And 
a dog or a horse might have a two-dimensional view, and we have a kind of a three-dimensional view, and then if you try to continue that, uh, why well, you come up against this kind of process of a very unique nature of time. time and where's the next one is time. Yeah. So no. that for yeah, us, yeah, time True. has a unique quality based precisely on uh, the fact that we are what we are. Uh, and then the kind of filters that we have and the kind of sensory perception we have, mm -hmm. the kind we have. And, and that's why, in other words, the act of birth, <laughs> following a truth, uh, could be, in some imaginative way, seen as the entrance from a higher dimension of that which we call ourselves and our life, our whole sure, life, sure, sure. from that point of view, can then be seen as an entity, not existing in time, but the time is just the illusion of our being the way we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that this is another way of looking at this idea of meta. You know, I mean, it's one way of getting at it, but it happens to be a rather abstract way and may not be very helpful. Then. No, that's, that's, that's the relationship between the ego and the daemon in Yates. When, uh, Robin, did you have something you just before Lois? Yeah. Bird? said a moment ago that time was that extra dimension. And I think it's not that time is the missing dimension, but that that dimension, that upper level, maps onto ours as time. That's how yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. Yeah. Not that it's another dimension, not at all. Yeah, yeah. It's a uniquely subjective thing. Yeah. So for us, discovering the metal level may be the timeless. You know, whether it's the eternal now or the ineffable moment or, you know, and not experience the next metal level as a time-bound experience at all, since we are in this procession of seeing the daemon's projection through time as this thing that we call us and the, and the ego, which may be fictional. Or if in meditation, you get the sense of the circle, the dimensional metaphor, and the circle represents your whole life. It's like being a identity, that way that... You get to the sentence, then you see the whole life. The one, whole of the, life is one of the interesting things about Gregory's way of thinking uh, is when you line up, say, the five analogies, the answer or the insight is not on the same plane and is not in time, in the same way that the grammar of English is not in time now that I'm talking English. And so uh, the nature of insight is a different... I suppose, in a sense, I'm trying to push you toward a, a Platonism of a kind of logos, you know, and almost in a Plotinus sense. And to seeing if you'll back away and say, no, I don't want that Logos. You know, <laughs> I don't believe in that Logos, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm not too far from a platonic position, obviously. Because it seems to me if there is, there is events, and there is thinking about events, and there is thinking about thinking, or the structure of structures, then the meta level is the, is the Logos which, you know, it becomes the structure of all possible structures, which is, you know, moving in a, in a theological direction as it's taken in Plotinus or, you know, the mystical West. Uh, 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 I begin to see. Uh, if you read von Neumann's theory of games, you will find that he has very carefully sliced the concept game so that it will fit within his epistemology, his mathematics. And in a von Neumann game, there are things called players, and players are incapable of fatigue, they're incapable of learning, they're incapable of death, they don't get bored, they have no voluntary control of whether they will play or not play. But they have built into them the entire mathematics necessary to solve the problems presented by that game. Right? They don't acquire that mathematics by playing it. That's built in by, hmm. by fate, by hypothesis. They are therefore very far from being human beings, obviously. And I objected to that. He calls them players. I said, you shouldn't call them players. You should call them robots <laughs> or computers. And he said, no, I don't want to do that because that's the sort of creature that I am professionally concerned with, computers. So I call them people. 
And I say, but that's the sort of thing I'm professionally concerned with. <laughs> <laughs> you can call them rebels. <laughs> but anyhow, in order to make this whole business stay within the bounds of mathematics, or his mathematics, I don't know, but anyway, his mathematics, uh, he has to have a finite top to the number of levels. And the finite top is defined by the rules of the game and by the fact that the creatures don't learn and the rules don't change and there's no fatigue and so on. To have the players learn to play the game would have introduced another level of logical typing, do you see? Mm. Or to have the rules of the game subject to change would introduce another level of logical typing. Now, I think preferentially, I won't say philosophically, but by preference, I don't really believe that we live within a finite that of logical types. That there is not the logos which cuts off at that point. Uh -huh. if, if there is a logos that cuts off at that point, then the whole thing can be computed out and, and why worry? You see. But if the only upper level is that we're not quite clever enough to master the next level. We get muddle-headed before we master it. Then life is sort of interesting. It's, you see, whether it's an infinite series or the series is longer than we can master, doesn't make much difference, point of natural history. Yeah? Marvin? Well, I think what I was going to comment was that when you were saying, when, when one experiences that One's experience is subjective. And you said this is enormously freeing. It, it also frees one in, into mystery. And this is where sure. your categories of the mystic, the artist, the epistemologist, no longer hold, are, are no longer relevant. They hold the. Um, so it and that perhaps is what you're calling as the, as the experience of the timeless. And that has no level, no, no top, no flat. Uh, I, I, that was just a, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I meant by that for the question. I didn't mean you in particular, but that's mm -hmm. for the question of to read. It, it can't be, <laughs> it, another can't lead you there. Mm -hmm. it, it happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed with the Suzuki film. With which one? With the uh, Suzuki film. Because he made it so clear that, that the discipline might be a help, but it wasn't necessary. Leaving it open then that any discipline can be mm -hmm. a means or not. But it's very difficult to be verbal or articulate about that about which you can't be verbal or articulate. <laughs> <laughs> But it's very important to... Go, go ahead. This is where I come in with Blake. This is where the realm fits. This is where the realm fits. Of subjective experience is this. <laughs> You see, I'm not, uh, I think people are misperceiving the question. I'm not asking Gregory for an answer. I'm placing a context for Gregory to think about something which, give, mm -hmm. which elicits an experience. Just like it's a necessary experience for the flashlight mysteriously to learn that it can't find the darkness by casting its beam forth. Now, there's no possible way we can explain how the flashlight discovers that it has to turn itself off. Now, mysticism are ways of telling us that. The interesting thing about Gregory is he's not a Zen Buddhist. He's not a, a Sufi or a yogi or anything else. He's a something else. And it's obviously he's coming at something through a something else. And there is a... <laughs> and I, now, wait, I don't know if you're hearing me. You think I'm working in a category of types and I'm looking in order to catalog and uh, pin him down to something. I'm, in a sense trying to elicit from Gregory uh, what I think is really implicit uh, because I think there is another kind of thinking as Gregory said in his book and I think this form of 
knowing is absolutely more intimately involved with our being, and in another sort of way, in the way in which Bird was talking about it, it's now almost necessary for our survival. Now, I think there is a, there is a thing called daemonic consciousness and ego consciousness, and I think there are, I see Gregory from time to time moving in a way that's really uh, critical. And it's another path. It's not the path of the, uh, the heavy discipline, zazen, five hours a day, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's very Western, and we don't even understand our own tradition. And therefore, in a sense, I'm trying to place certain kinds of things of, from our own tradition, like the Logos or the Plotinus or, or Plato, but not in any way to say this is how you get from metal level uh, B to metal level A and a hierarchy of types, because when you were talking, I think the whole spatial notion of a series has to be thrown out, because that seems to me a totally foreign way of describing something that may be a Mobia strip or maybe something else, but the, the category, the hierarchy of, of logical types begins to be a ladder and the latter always makes you think it's a regress ad infinitum, and that gets you into Euclidean yeah, space, yeah, yeah, and it just yeah. takes you nowhere, you know. I think an enormous amount. You see, the uh, each of these steps, if they be steps, however you, you want to take them, always depend upon a multitude of would depend upon a class of examples. Not a single example, but a class of examples. Now, the class might only have one example in it, but that example has got to be handled as a class to make the jump. Now, this is one of the very important points which he didn't touch at all. Um, I don't know, I was complaining at lunch yesterday somewhere uh, that the difficulty is people don't treat an example as an example. That is, they don't treat it as a member of a class. They treat it as itself. If you stuck it at the itself level, you, you don't know what the class, whether, where you can go to the next. Um, the, well, the parable, uh, we taught porpoises to do something new every time they came on the stage. I'm sure I talked about this last year, but it doesn't matter. Um, the rule of the game was the trainer would stand up and say to the audience, well, we're going to show you how we train porpoises. Uh, when she comes out from the holding tanks onto the exhibition tank, I will watch her, and as soon as she does something I want her to repeat, I'll blow the whistle and give her a fish. And then you'll see her repeat the thing that I marked with the blow of the whistle, right? Now, to do this five times a day, six times a week, which is what is required, you couldn't have the porpoise do the same thing every time it came on stage, you see, and say we taught it that this morning because they taught it that yesterday. And you've got to have, in fact, the porpoise come on stage and do something new, right? And what the porpoise is going to have to learn is to come on stage and do something other than what it did yesterday and at various times. And the porpoise will do this, and he did learn this, she did learn this. <coughs> but this is a learning that could not, this is a, this is a, a deutero learning, you see. This is a, a different order of learning from learning to do a particular thing for a particular signal. You've got to do a new thing for a particular signal. And you could only conceivably learn this from a class of training sessions, not from a single training session. Now, we finally had the thing repeated, got a new porpoise, and what would happen would be that in the eighth session, say, the porpoise would spend two-thirds of the session doing what she was rewarded for in the seventh, 
and then accidentally would do something new, quote, which the trainer could regard as new. And the trainer would blow the whistle, reward that, and that would be repeated, and then repeated for two-thirds of the next session, till again the thing broke. Right? But between the 14th and 15th session, the porpoise got enormously excited, splashing and jumping in the holding tanks, and when she came on for the 15th session, she did 12 new things, one after the other. <laughs> mm -hmm. But she couldn't do that, you see, without a class of training sessions to work with. The single one will never teach it. This is the demonstration that, in fact, we are moving up from a class to a class of classes, or from an item to a class. It is a logical type move in the, the tactical Russellian sense. Okay. <clears throat> and you can't do it on one jump. Uh, the other thing which I would like just to finish because I don't think it's fair to the porpoise not to say, um, is that the trainer would never obey the rules. She would always throw away some fish that the porpoise hadn't earned. She was told never to reward the porpoise until it does something new. But she would throw unowned fish to the porpoise. Because she's got to, so to speak, hold the animal's hand up to the point. The animal gets dreadfully frustrated, you know. This is a miserable situation in which you don't know what it is the trainer's trying to teach you and it keeps not being what you thought, and you do what she said five minutes ago and she doesn't reward, huh? here we have a situation into which the trainer would throw unearned fish to maintain the relationship with the porpoise. She cannot afford to lose the relationship to the porpoise. She's got to... State her love for the porpoise up to the point when the porpoise discovers the next move. Then, then you give it a fine fat cigar, you know. <laughs>